So my, my question is, um, we've seen the rise of the Chinese uh, economy, and uh, what will this, uh, what do you think it has had to say, and what will it have to say for civil and political human rights in the future? Will we see a China that has to adjust to more international scrutiny, or will we see, uh, or are we seeing um, uh, that realpolitik, that business trade is increasingly triumphing human rights? So that's a question for all of you. Yes? Well, which way do you want to go? Do you want, do you want to begin with? Yeah. Um, well, it's a, it's a difficult question. I, I think definitely uh, we don't, previously, and, and some people, particularly in the last government we had were sort of had a very strong belief in as soon as you have a middle class you'll have political reform and, and more respect for, for civil and political rights. I think to some extent that the Chinese the last 30 years of China has proved that that is not an automatic development. On the other hand um, uh, as Turbjörn Felix said there are so many things happening now at the same time that all are, I think, to some extent, are connected with the fact that China has had uh, an economic development. Um, I mean, people are getting as rich as they are due to corruption because there is more money around. Uh, the, the information technology is spreading because people have more money to invest in, in mobile phones and so on. Um, so, in the long run, I believe it's it's not possible for the Communist Party to, to, to keep the grip they have now. But, but I think there is a question whether this would be soft uh, or whether they, their stronghold will be so brutal that at some point it becomes more like a, a revolution. I'm not talking about next year or anything, but I mean, it's, I think there is a, there is a kind of momentum towards this, and, and, and I think up until now, one could, I, I've, been, I've always feared that what I call the Chinese model, because it is a model that a lot of authoritarian societies would like to copy, where they can stay in power, but sort of buy people off with economic development. Um, we see Russia, to some extent, doing the same. A few other countries around the world are sort of uh, copying it, but, but I, I, inevitably, I think it will have to change, because I think as, as people get educated, they won't take it anymore, if they're not a lot smarter than they are now and, and actually get rid of corruption and, and start getting the health care system in place and the educational system in place and everything. Very long and not very good answer, sorry. Want to ask me, David? Well, I, I hope I answered that question in my talk uh, generally, but a couple of points I'd like to add. One is, you just mentioned Russia, John, and uh, I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, that David Matus and I are banned from going to Russia. I take that as a badge of honor, by the way. Um, we, our book that we wrote about organ pillaging in China, I, did, I don't think Russia is mentioned in the book, but the uh, an appeal court in southern Russia ruled that we had written terrorist literature, can you imagine, for criticizing the government of China? So we, the two of us have been banned from going to Russia. And uh, I, uh, you live closer to Russia than we do, I think. but. Uh, uh, as you said, absolutely. One of the, the governments that I'm really concerned about is that of Sri Lanka. I, I don't know whether you, you all follow what's happening in Sri Lanka, but I actually am quite proud of Prime Minister of Canada and India not going to the Commonwealth Conference. Uh, I, don't, you, I think you have a number of, of refugees in, in Norway from Sri Lanka, and if you do, I'm sure you know that the, uh, the Tamil community has been treated appallingly for the last 30 or 40 years in Sri Lanka and unfortunately Rajapaska government is moving far too much in the direction of the, China, of the Chinese model. One other, oh, one other thing I would mention, if it doesn't fit your question I realize, but uh, uh, you may not know that Nexon Oil was taken over recently in Calgary by a state-owned enterprise, Sunok, the Chinese National Oil Company, and uh, Something like 74% of Canadians were opposed to that. The, our government allowed it to happen but said it would never happen again. I wish they had stopped, uh, prevented Sunoke from taking over a, a very good company in Canada with 3,000 employees. Because one of the things that Sunoke has done is it's persecuted its Falun Gong employees. And uh, I think it's 74 employees of Sunoke in China were, were basically abused and persecuted because they happen to be Falun Gong practitioners. I realize I don't think anything I've said has applied to your question, but I hope I answered it in my talk. <laughs>
Okay, Tony, do you want to add something? You know, uh, former uh, communist le leader in China, Deng Xiaoping, he has been credited with uh, uh, the opening of China, and I think that uh, uh, opening was very important because under Chairman Mao, the country was hermetically sealed, and uh, no fresh air came in at all. Um, so there is a very big difference between then and now, and uh, you cannot. Um, you cannot. Uh, you have started a kind of development which is impossible to stop. To stop, and we have uh, mentioned uh, information technology and internet and all these things which are very important. I should also like to add that there are other factors influencing the development in China in the years to come. Um, this year, more than 100 million Chinese are traveling abroad for different reasons as tourists, academics, students, and you know, everything. And also tourists from, tourists from other countries are going to China in increasing numbers, in the millions, uh, leaving their footprints everywhere in that big country. Chinese are studying in abroad in increasing numbers. Uh, these days, almost 200,000 uh, students in the United States 70,000 in Britain, I don't know, uh, know how many in Canada, 65,000 uh, 65, in France, 60,000 in Germany, and so on. The list is very long, and there are many in Norway. Many of uh, these students, but not all, they will return to China someday and influence the development in their own country. So uh, the pressure on the Chinese uh, political system is immense already and it will uh, continue to be like that and maybe even even tougher in the years to come, absolutely. Yeah. Here, here. Thank you. So I have a couple of uh, questions to have. I begin with the man in the middle here. I think I saw something on the, uh, on the left. I'm not sure. Yes, uh, how do you do that? Uh, someone in the back too? I thought I saw a hand, but maybe I'm wrong. In that case, in any case, you will start, and then I'll take your question afterwards. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Peter Koren, Peter Koren, and I'm very interested in the Tibetan question. And I was very happy to hear two persons from the panel actually mentioning Tibet. Uh, Tibet was occupied by China in 1949. There was a, some waves in the occupation, from 1959, it was so oppressive that the Dalai Lama had to leave uh, Tibet. A lot of Tibetans have left with him. And even it, little Norway received um, refugees from Tibet. Very few, but they were a minority in this country. We talked about Tibet. After that, we seem to be forgetting Tibet. Uh, I have a beautiful book in my home, given to me by the representation of China here in, in Norway. It's called China's Tibet. Hmm. That's the last time I've ever heard uh, Chinese mentioning Tibet. Now it's China. And we're all uh, tending to talk about China, Western China, etc., but China. So I would like to hear the view of the panel. Is Tibet lost? Or is it a way to revive Tibet? And I have one more question to everybody here. Could you please start mentioning Tibet? <laughs> everybody, any occasion, any chance, talk about Tibet. Thank you. Thank you. I think you can take that, answer that question right away. I guess that was a question to the whole panel. So yes. do you want to begin, uh, David? Sure. Yeah, thank you very much for raising Tibet. Um, boy, where do I start? Uh, the Dalai Lama is holding this as a, as a honorary citizen of Canada. Why don't you make him an honorary citizen, or have you, of Norway? No, we, we don't dare to do that. Well, uh, believe, believe me, you should, because uh, he's. I saw a poll not long ago that he was the most admired leader in, uh, in Western Europe. He's a magnificent person. He, he came to Ottawa about a year ago. We had a big conference there, and uh, he uh, had about 7,000 people paid $50 to go and hear him. 
none of the money went to him, it all went to Tibetan refugees who were coming to Canada. How, since you're such a wealthy country, why don't you bring even more Tibetan refugees to Norway? They are wonderful people, as I'm sure you know. Um, I was walking recently in France for uh, three or four days with a woman from China, very highly educated woman, and um, it touches on your point. She, um, we were talking about democracy in China and so on, and she said, well, you know, we need uh, we need uh, authoritarian government in China because the Dalai Lama wants to take Tibet out of China by force. Well, I explained to her that the Dalai Lama has never abdicated force on any matter, and he does not even want to take Tibet out of China, as I hope you agree. He wants some autonomy for Tibet. But that's the kind of thinking you get from even educated people when they get non-stop propaganda uh, from from the, the party. Uh, one other, um, um, I, I think I can tell you that, that uh, well, why don't I stop there? <laughs> okay, do you want to add? Well, I think that uh, Tibet has a very um, strategic signif significance for, for China uh, in the sense that uh, the country is next uh, to India, another great power in Asia. Um, and uh, Tibet may be rich in mineral resources and it is the water tower of Asia. Uh, many um, big rivers are coming from Tibet, the roof of the world. Uh, and you know, in the old times, um, the Chinese emperors, there were many dynasties in China. Some dynasties or some emperors they were very strong. They so, so they were able to have a certain degree of control in the outlying areas of the empire. Um, some emperors were quite weak. So in these periods, uh, Tibet uh, was more or less um, independent. And the Tibetans felt that they were quite independent and free, which was the case until 1949, because that was a period with um, many problems, internal problems in China and civil war and so on. Then came the, the Chinese occupation uh, in 1950 and 51, and uh, I think uh, China will never leave Tibet. So the only big question now is how much freedom uh, will the Tibetans be able to get within the limits of the present system? And as you probably know, Dalai Lama, uh, from his exile in India, is also saying that we don't demand full freedom or independence anymore. Our only demand is um, self-government within the present system uh, of the People's Republic of China. So if this is possible or not, uh, we don't know. But, you know, yeah. It will, it's hard to say. Now, uh, Dalai Lama is an old man. Uh, he's almost uh, 80 years old. And it, I think that the Chinese are waiting for him to die. Although he is maybe half God, also Dalai Lama will die someday. So um, after him, probably it will be easier for the Chinese leaders to tackle uh, the Tibetan problem. But we don't know really, because there are many young people now inside and also outside uh, Tibet, Tibetans, which are very anxious to go ahead and fight for more freedom for the Tibetan people. Yeah. I'll try to be very brief. Um, I apologize for not having said Tibet in my uh, <laughs> <laughs> introduction. Tibet, 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 Tibet. Is it a lost case? I, I, it's certain, as, as Tobias said, it is certainly one of the cases in power in general and China, including Tibet and Xinjiang, is obviously a major priority for the Chinese, uh, which also uh, creates a lot of very brutal oppression of Tibetans. Of course, now with the, we, we've seen now long prison sentences for people who have been communicating outside of China about the self-immolation of, of more than 100 uh, Tibetans. Uh, so just sort of talking about that is now being targeted very uh, very harshly. So um, I, I've learned once that the Chinese have sort of ring fence areas when they uh, negotiate, and that Tibet is you know bullseye <laughs> within those rings. You do not touch that question without facing consequences. 
Okay, so I have the next question here, the gentleman here, and I think we'll have to take uh, a couple of questions at the same time. So afterwards, I have uh, one in the back there. Uh, I have one question. Uh, can anyone give me any good reason why China should be a member of the Arctic Council, and why Norway, or for that matter, Canada should support such a claim? I absolutely agree with you. It's preposterous that they were, they're now an official observer, are they? Yeah. Observer status. I, uh, and uh, as, in fact, I read an article on the plane coming over here about what they're doing in Iceland. Have we got no backbone in the Arctic Council? Or is Canada and Norway and the rest of us, do we have nothing down the back of our backs? Uh, are we just a bunch of wimps? Yes. Wussies, I think is the term. Yes. I think we'll take the question from here too, and then I'll give the whole panel a chance to, to answer. Richie Scarborough, currently on leave from the uh, Foreign Ministry. Um, I've, uh, I think it's very useful to be reminded of all the human rights violations that we have seen and also continue to see in China. It's furthermore also useful to be reminded of the Dalai Lama's wish for the uh, autonomy of Tibet to be more than in name as it is now. Um, as a Foreign Service uh, official, I've had my a uh, part of going to uh, opposition trials and visiting uh, imprisoned journalists and so on in a different place than China, but under a regime which definitely was uh, going uh, uh, worse by every single year. Now, um, just uh, two weeks ago when I visited China last, the Global Times, admittedly in English, was publishing the result of a public opinion poll regarding how many people uh, wanted political reforms and around 1,500 people I believe had been questioned for this poll and um, they were also discussing very openly how uh, the correspondence between people's education level and income was uh, related to their stand on political reforms. Now my question is for Mr. Egenes uh, although I think you gave a very balanced view of the positive as well as the negative trends um, for your rather political conclusion on anything that threatens the uh, party's um, uh, overall control, how do you explain that uh, this kind of discussion pops up in official Chinese media? And is there a chance that we are that there are trends that we are missing out uh, in our overall evaluation of where this whole thing is going. And another question <coughs> would be for Mr. Fadovic. Um, how do you evaluate the uh, uh, option of discussing uh, labor rights, rights for, for uh, uh, workers basically, workers' rights uh, with the Chinese and making progress on, on that front? Thank you. Okay, so we have one question then regarding the explanation of debate about political reforms in China. And we have one about labor rights. And if you want to add something about uh, your question on the reasoning behind China being a part of the Arctic Council, you can add something there too. So it was a question specifically to uh, the Oregon first. Me first yeah. um, um, well, I, I, I will, of course, not say there are, there are no trends we don't know of and don't understand. Of course, I'm sure there are. There's, this is a huge, vast continent, more or less, with, with one-fifth of the, of, the, of the population of the world. So I'm sure, certainly, I miss a lot of it, and, and even Amnesty probably misses uh, some of it. Um, what we have seen and, and over a <coughs> relatively long period of time is that there is an opening to discuss controversial questions in controlled areas, so to speak, within academia, within English-speaking newspapers, and so on and so forth. So, so I think certainly there is, there is a scope there. And, I, and that's why I said um, on a very particular area that if, if the debate that went, goes on in more close quarters on the death penalty could actually reach the people, for instance, by the numbers of executed being, being uh, uh, published, then I think something could happen with, with, this, with this punishment. Um, so I, I think what we see and have seen is the allowance of debates to go on in certain closed quarters and if they go beyond that's when they become uh, dangerous and contagious and that's when we see them being stopped and people being arrested. 
Um, so a lot of, of and, and this is also always difficult when you communicate about uh, human rights violations in China is that people say, but I've seen a person say this, this, and this. Uh, and you claim that uh, a similar person, a pe person having said something similar has been arrested and, and put to prison for 11 years. I think it's also very important who says what. Yeah. Um, whether, um, I, think, I think this is very simplistic, but I'll just stop with this. I think whether you are seen as dangerous or not is your potential to gather people around you. If you're an individual academic who doesn't really have any mobilize, mobilizing power, you can say a lot. If you're, I think the reason Liu Xiaobo got 11 years when he got it, which at that point was a long sentence for his crime, uh, was because there was, he was seen as somebody who could mobilize around his, uh, his writings and his demands. And I think that's also the citizen movement's predicament now. They see that there is a mobilizing power, and therefore we stop you. Next question was for Tudbin uh, Fadevik uh, regarding labor rights. Yes, according uh, to my understanding, this uh, question was about uh, the state of affairs for Chinese uh, workers. You know, in China, uh, there are no real independent trade unions. Uh, it has never been like that. Uh, the present uh, trade union um, organization in China is just a branch of the, of the Communist Party and ruled by the party. Um, so for Chinese workers it has been a tough time since 1980. Um, but these days much is changing anyway because of shortage of labor. There is an increasing shortage of labor in China due to the one-child policy, as you may know. So um, uh, many factories in China these days, they have problem recruiting workers. And uh, young people these days in, in the country, they want to go to the service sector, which is expanding and so on. Which means that uh, workers in China will be able in the years to come to sell themselves at a higher price uh, uh, which uh, should uh, give them probably more welfare, more benefits and so on, but it remains to be seen. There is also a possibility for China to import workers from abroad, although I don't think that will be possible in large numbers. Okay, one short comment. Uh, I, I was at a forum yesterday in Stockholm and uh, somebody who's very knowledgeable about China pointed out that the uh, percentage of the economy that is, is in wages in China is about 9%, whereas in most countries in Western Europe it's more than 50%. And I'm sure it's more than 50% in Norway and Canada. When you mentioned the, the Global Times, I, the only thing I would read, I read in the Global Times that I would believe would be the date. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I have a question here from uh, Ed Jensen, and I have a question from Bor Larsen. Uh, yeah, my question is to David. Um, I saw it um, in the documentary in China. Uh, it was, by the way, it's made by um, um, Perlman, who made the Tibetan uh, documentary as well. Uh, there was something had been on the website of the Chinese hospital that we don't take organ from brain dead people to keep the organs of good quality. Uh, is that something you have come across also when you made the investigation, these, uh, these things? Well, it's just that, that in the culture of, of China, and I don't think there's any disagreement on this, uh, people do not like to donate organs. And uh, it's part of the culture that you want your body to be buried intact. So there's a very, very limited uh, amount of organ donation, not just in China, but in Taiwan and uh, uh, elsewhere in the diaspora, the Chinese diaspora. So I, I would, uh, no, we didn't come across that uh, at all. Uh, and uh, as I think I mentioned in my talk, it's, it, last year it was less than 300 donations were made voluntarily in China. I mean, 1.3 billion people and you have 200 donations? It's, that's insignificant. So the culture of voluntary donations in China is, is not, uh, not creating uh, at this point, at least, any to any significant number of donations. My perspective was rather that when you take the organs from not brain dead people, then it, by, as a matter of fact, they are alive. So these organs are taken from, from live Yeah, people. well, I can give you an example from actually 1995, I think it is, where um, in uh, 
in the Uyghur part of China, a man by the name of Elver Toti was a, was a doctor, and he went to an execution, and uh, he, uh, somebody was shot in the right-hand side of their chest, and he was ordered to remove the heart from the left-hand side, of course, and the man was still alive. And uh, Toti did this, uh, but was so upset by it that he left China, and he's now, uh, he's now in London. And uh, he's driving a bus in London, by the way. Uh, but that's how, that's how the in, inhuman the system was. And I'm sure you all know that the Uyghur community, like the Tibetans and Falun Gong, are treated, uh, are treated outrageously you know, by, the, uh, by the government. The first time I, I went to China, was raised earlier as sort of an official capacity as Minister for Asia, I went to a, a briefing by somebody on the, the 53 minorities in China. And uh, he was Tibetan. And who was it who said earlier that he sat me down, he said, actually, Tibet now is a paradise. And, you know, I actually believed some of the things he said. But as I think you mentioned, there have been 120 self-immolations in Tibet in the last year or so. And Tibetans, ladies and gentlemen, do not kill themselves unless they are absolutely desperate. So uh, anyone who thinks that Tibet is a paradise. I'm embarrassed to tell you that a Canadian company build the, it helped to build the railway from to Tibet. It's supposed to be for tourists. I mean, it's, I'm ashamed of the fact that one of our companies did that. Okay, so we are running out of time now. Uh, we have uh, two last questions. What we'll do now is we'll hear uh, these both questions first, and then you'll have to, you can answer uh, the questions, and uh, if you want to add something for your closing statements, you can do that at the same time. So I have uh, Bor Larsen here, and I have the man in the back there. So we'll hear both questions first. Yeah. There are different narratives about China. One is that they are a bit foolish, that they don't understand Western democracies, and uh, that the democracy was somehow uh, overturned the, the regime by itself in a Hegelian way, that you know everything is progressing. But on the other hand, there is a narrative that the Chinese are more clever than we, we actually believe, because they are working together with Russia, actually, to promote different views of what human rights are. If you look at the Cold War, you know, you have two sets of human rights. One is economical, the other is political. And when you see actually the foreign minister going out, in, our foreign minister going out in the newspapers and, and giving um, a very good um, description of China uh, as raising people out of poverty and that the political rights are not the major cause of, of uh, connections between China and Norway. That is saying that, uh, and this comes from a conservative uh, foreign minister, you could say that China might be- You need to have the question soon. <laughs> yes, they might be succeeding of what the Russians never succeeded in, and that is making slow and, and systematically the Western democracies into giving away some of the issue of political rights. Could this be a strategy from Russia and China that they are working very systematically on in the long-term scale. Yes, I'm not going to repeat that question. But you'll hear your question in the back here. Okay, my name is Dan Coleman. Um, since Tibet and uh, Dalai Lama was mentioned, I think it's fair to the panel that they also said, would say something about Taiwan. It was not mentioned uh, with the trading partners uh, of Asia as a, as a last speech. Can Taiwan play any role at all, or is it sliced out of Asia? Uh, and yeah, uh, what about the regime? Can it be a, an example? Part of it, I think. So the last question is, can Taiwan play any role at all? I think we'll start with uh, the opposite uh, as we did at first. We'll start with Tudgarn, then with Pedro, and then David, you will get a chance to, to close this session. Oh, well, yeah. I can uh, try to say a few words about uh, Taiwan, also because I've been there recently. And uh, it is my impression these days uh, that um, there is uh, very much uh, exchange, you know, uh, lately between uh, Taiwan and, and the mainland, and it is increasing. Uh, there are direct connections uh, now. I can remember I went to Taiwan in 1980, 
uh, and I met the foreign ministry in Taiwan at that time and he said to me that there will never be any direct exchange with the Chinese communists. These days, you know, there are exchanges and, uh, you know, trade is going on and I think for uh, Taiwan's economy, uh, the Chinese mainland these days is very important. Um, however, uh, there is no um, unification plans. There are no plans for unification uh, at the present stage and uh, the leaders in Taipei keep saying that unless uh, there is political reform in, in the mainland, in the People's Republic of China, we are not interested in reunification at all. But meanwhile, both parties now are very pragmatic, so they are able to trade and to have many exchanges in the academic field, research and so on, which is very important. Um, some people in Taiwan these days feel that um, th this little island has become too dependent on the mainland. It remains to, to be seen, but of course um, yeah, I think uh, the mainland anyway will be, will be able to put pressure on this small island with only 20 or 25 million people. So, um, okay, uh, this is David and Goliath. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know enough about Taiwan and their role, so I'll leave that to Julian. He's answered that. Um, is there a strategy? Um, I, I, first of all, just let's make it very clear that the Chinese aren't very good at, at uh, fulfilling the, the Chinese population's social and economic rights either. <laughs> so it's not that like they've sort of sorted that and they've kept the similar political rights, although, of course, there have been changes because of the economic growth. Um, yeah, I, I, be I believe. And, and this is me, I don't have any academic research behind it. But I believe that China, believe that they have come up with a model uh, where they, whereby they can satisfy people and in a sense buy them off with economic growth and, and call it uh, a fulfillment of, of uh, uh, social and, and, and economic rights for a large enough portion of the population uh, for them to accept less freedom. I don't think necessarily they're right, but I think that is a model they believe they will, they will they want to sustain and they would hope they could sustain. The question is, of course, whether it's possible or not. David? Well, one, one of the things that the regime says in Beijing is that the, the democracy is not suited to the Asian values. <laughs> well, of course, Taiwan puts the lie to that uh, rather splendidly, doesn't it? Uh, in fact, I was an observer at the election last year in Taiwan. There were about 31 foreigners that went to observe the election. The election was essentially, ladies and gentlemen, free and fair. The problem was that the KMT, as you probably all know, when Chiang Kai-shek moved into Taiwan in 49, they seized all of the properties that the government of Japan had held, but instead of turning them over to the government of Taiwan, they turned them over to the party, the KMT. So it's the, I think it's the wealthiest political party in the world. But despite that, uh, democracy is working in Taiwan, as you said, very well. And uh, and so to say that the people of Chinese origin are not able to have a democracy is is nonsense. And uh, but uh, uh, what else? Um, I have a, given a lot of speeches about Taiwan. If you go to my name on Google, you'll get uh, my website, which has got a lot of material on Taiwan. And uh, uh, there, are, by the way, the per capita income in Taiwan is something. I think it's about seven times what the per capita income in China is. And so this point about the Russian-Chinese model is, is, uh, is, is nonsense, absolute nonsense. But we've got to say it. We can't just meet someone from China and keep, our, keep silent. We've got to speak up a lot, as my two colleagues have done so well today. I think we are, we are out of the territory now. Taiwan is a fully democratic country. And no matter how many more times that the GDP per capita from China is over Taiwan, that's a totally different different thing because we are a lot more average. Like everybody has more or less the same. While as a disparity on income in China is huge, so it's a totally different story. Okay. Yes, I'm sure there's a lot of questions we could discuss, but we have to wrap this this meeting up now. So uh, thank you very much to our to our panel for your uh, introductions and for this debate, and thank thank you to the audience for your questions.